Uh, InshaAllah, uh, this is not going to be a long talk, bi'ilmillah, and I hope to make it as interactive as possible, not among yourselves, but between yourselves and me, so we'll try to cut down the conversation, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, the title of this talk, as it was given to me, was The Importance of Company, and inshaAllah I'm going to start with a hadith of the Prophet wasallam. and as we continue throughout this talk, this talk, that one hadith is the central idea that I'm trying to get across. And the hadith is, the, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, الْمَرْءُ عَلَى دِينِ خَلِيلِهِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِمْ What that means in simple English is, a person depends on the religion of their friend. A person depends on the religion of their friend. So watch out each of you who you make a friend, who you make friends with. So in other words, it doesn't matter if you're knowledgeable or righteous or religious or not, your downfall will not come from you necessarily, it will come from who? Your friend, right? So in this very powerful hadith, the Messenger of Allah gave us religious advice, and the advice doesn't have anything to do with worship, or spending time learning religion or anything. The essential advice is who you make friends with, right? So it's the center, it's one of the most essential things in our religion, who you make friends with. I'll give you a small example about friendship. I met this person uh, a couple of months ago who was actually in jail a few times. He had been arrested a few times for trying to rob and, and uh, for drug dealing and things like this. And one of his friends was Muslim, one of his friends. And after being getting in trouble so many times, he, he didn't have a place to stay, so he called up this old friend of his who happened to be a Muslim and said, can I hang out with you for a few days? Can I just stay over with you? So he stayed over with him, and as he spent time with that, that friend of his, he got introduced to how that friend of his lives a life of Islam, and he actually took shahada, he became a Muslim, right? And now he's actually, I know him from, he's, he lives in Cincinnati, and because of him, I know at least a dozen people that have become Muslim, right? But this person, the only thing that Allah, you know, Allah is the one who guides, but the only door Allah opened for him, that brought him to Islam and made him a vehicle for so many other people to accept Islam, the only thing was a friend. That's all Allah did for him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He opened the door to a friend. That's all it was. On the other hand, at the same time, one has to be very careful of the wrong kinds of friends. Now, what I'm going to share with you tonight is something I've only talked about before one other time. And that is the different kinds of friends that are talked about in the Qur'an. The Qur'an actually te speaks about the, the matter, the subject matter of friendship and gives friends different terms. So there is different Arabic vocabulary that I'm going to be sharing with you. I don't expect all of you to remember it, but I'd be impressed if you did, inshallah. So I'll start with the first one. The first term for a friend or an associate that's used in the Qur'an is qareen. Qareen, okay? Now it's not used in the best connotation. So I'm going to share with you in what connotation it occurs before I explain to you what this actually means. قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ إِنِّي كَانَ لِي قَرِينٌ There's a bunch of people that make it all the way to Jannah. They're hanging out together, the best of the rewards are being given to them. In the midst of all their good times, one of them says, you know, I used to have this قَرِينٌ. I used to have this friend. So this guy's already made it to Jannah, he's hanging out with his new friends, and in the back of his mind, the thought comes, there's this friend I used to have, that I used to hang out with all the time. Now I'll tell you a little bit about the word qareen. The word qareen actually comes from another word in Arabic, qiran, which is a rope used in Arabic to tie two camels together. So qareen is a kind of friend that's always with you. They're always spending time with you. They're always calling you, they're always texting you, they're always emailing you. If whenever you get on your email, this, the first uh, instant message that pops up is theirs, right? So this is a friend that's always, always, always around. Like in college, it could be your roommate. Right, the person that's always right next to you, or the guy that sits next to you in every class in school or something. Right, this is your qareen. So this person gets to Jannah and he says, "I used to have a qareen." Now, come to think of it, I wonder what happened to him. Right, and then he says, "Yaqulu." He remembers what his qareen, his really close friend, used to say to him. Yaqul, "Inna kalamin al musaddiqin." He used to say, "Man, come on, you pray and you, you know, you don't look it, look this way or that way, and you don't go to these websites and you don't have these problems." You don't go to that party that everybody's going to. Really? And you think you're on the right path? You're from the truthful, apparently? So my qareen, my buddy, who used to be in the old, he used to live a life of partying, basically, 
He used to make fun of me because I, I used to avoid all of those things. Now, keep in mind, when people are friends, they have access to the same thing. You know, your friend wants to go play basketball. Before he goes, what does he do? He gives you a call and says, you want to go? Right? He's going to go see a movie or something. Before he goes, or she goes, they're going to call. They're going to say, hey, you want to join me? Right? So when people are really close together, they want to take, uh, when friendship is like that, then whenever act one does, does an activity, he invites the other to that activity. So it seems as though this, this, this qirara that has been mentioned, what it implies is, most of us, we make friendships based on mutual interest, right? So you make friendships, for example, a lot of my friends I made in high school were people I met on the basketball court. I, I used to play basketball, these guys came and showed up, and we became friends, right? So we make friends based on mutual interest. So before you turn towards Allah and you leave your life of sin, maybe you used to hang out with these people that did things that aren't exactly pleasing to Allah. But you became close to them. Now they're your friend. But all of a sudden you heard a khutbah or two, or you came into contact with knowledge that affected your heart and you want to change the way you live. You don't want to spend your time doing those kinds of things anymore. But your friends haven't changed. So whenever they want to go hang out, or they want to go play pool at this bar, at, at mid near midnight, I don't want you to call you. For those of you that are younger, your friends want to email you something that they don't want your parents to know about, right? Or they want you to create a profile on Facebook that's kind of secretive, or whatever it may be, right? This, whatever it may be that they invite you to, you say, you know what? I used to be into that stuff. I don't, I don't want it anymore. And when you say I don't want it anymore, they're going to probably poke fun at you. Say, come on, what's the matter with you? What's the, you, you? All of a sudden, you're so righteous. You're the sheikh now. You know, come on, I know you. He used to be like, I mean, last two, two months ago. Remember? For God's sake, now you're going to act all holy? You know? So they're going to come after you, and this is what the person says. He, I used to remember he used to poke at me. He used to say, المصدقين, And then when I used to say, you know, I, I'm afraid of hellfire, man. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to do this stuff. The only reason is, I don't want to stand in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment. I don't want to be answering for all of these things. All of these moments I spend in questionable environments, all of the things I look at that are questionable, Allah is going to ask me for everything I looked at. يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ He says, He knows even what you steal with your eyes, you look at something inappropriate, and you don't think anybody else realized that you were staring, Allah knows He saw it. He knows that too. He knows the stealing of the eyes. وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورِ And whatever else the chests are hiding. He knows that stuff. So this believing friend says to this guy who's not so serious about the religion, he says, No, you know what? I'm scared of standing in front of Allah. I don't want to be answerable. So that's why I'm not joining you. I'm just, I, I can't do it, right? So this person turns around and says, Come on, أَيْذَا مِتْنَا وَكُنَّا تُرَابًا وَعِظَامًا أَيْنَا لَمَدِينٌ Come on, get real. When we're going to be, we're going to die, our graves are going to get eaten, you know, our bodies are going to be eaten by worms and all kinds of insects and we're going to decay. How are we going to come back to life and Allah is going to question us? Come on, get real. We're going to have all this judgment in front of us, there's going to be a whole record. All of, our thing, all of our actions are on a, some kind of video archive that's going to be played in front of us. And all of this data is going to come out. Come on, please, get real. It's not going to happen. Just relax, man. Chill out. Let's just go. Right? That's what he used to say to me. And I didn't used to listen to him. Now, now this, this person in Jannah, he's with his new friends that are, of course, now in Jannah. And now they really get to party. Right? So he says to them, Hey, you want to see him? You want to see my old friend? هَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُطَّلِعُونَ you, you want to see what he's like, what, how he's doing nowadays? So guess what? They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is he at? So now the next thing that happens is فَطَّلَعَ فَرَآهُ فِي سَوَاءِ الْجَحِيمِ Then he manifested, meaning they get to go, you could almost say like the fence of paradise, and they look over and what's underneath? What's at the bottom? Hellfire. And there's that guy burning there. فِي سَوَاءِ الْجَحِيمِ In the worst part of the blazing fire. This guy's being burned and tortured. So these used to be close buddies, right? They were hanging out together, they wanted to do everything together, and they were, they were tight, basically, right? And now one of them is looking from paradise into the hellfire, and he sees his buddy from old times, right? And then he looks at him, and he says, قَالَ تَاللَّهِ إِن كِتَّ لَتُرْدِينَ Man, I swear by Allah. And تَاللَّهِ is not the same as wallahi. If you have Arab friends, they like saying wallahi, right? But this is تَاللَّهِ تَاللَّهِ when you're really shocked. Or when you're really scared and terrified or angered, some emotion has overwhelmed you, then you don't say, Wallahi, you say, Tallahi instead. Okay, that's a rare usage in Arabic. So he says, Tallahi, and then he says, basically in English means, I swear by Allah, man, oh my God. You know this, this expression you have? Oh my God. You know, he sees this guy, what does he say? In kitta la It's all, you almost made me trip. 
you almost took me with you. You know, if that, the word that's used in Arabic here, it's used when you make somebody else, you push somebody else off a cliff. Or you push somebody else into a ditch. You, somebody was standing in a risky place, and they, were, they would have been okay by themselves, but somebody else comes in, puts them off balance, so they fall with the intention of destroying them. So the guy in Jannah says, man, I almost listened to you. Almost. Thank God I didn't give in. <laughs> Look at where you are. In Gitta la Turdi. So it's so Allah, it's such a huge, huge thing. What how a friend can out of just being buddies to you can destroy you. Can utterly destroy you. And then he, he realizes the favor that Allah has done to him. So he says, Had it not been for the favor of my Lord, that favor was what? What was the favor? Can you think of what everything I've said so far? What was the favor of Allah on this person? Huh? Within the context of what I said, something specifically was the favor. Huh? Something about a friend? That's pay attention. That's the title, something about friends or something. But what is the favor of Allah on this person? What, what is he so grateful for? What did Allah give him the power to say to his friend? No. No, I can't, man. No, stop. You go, whatever. I, I don't even think you should go, but if you're going to go, at least I'm not coming with you. Allah gave me that strength. That is the favor of Allah on this person that saved him from hellfire. That he gets to party in Jannah and talk about that fading memory of that loser friend that's burning in hellfire now. So he says, لَوْلَا نِعْمَةُ رَبِّي لَكُنْتُ مِنَ الْمُخْضَرِينَ Had it not been for that favor, I would have been from those who, been, who are being presented as an example today. You know, you, you, the people in Jannah say, man, look at that, thank God we're not there. And I would have been one of those people that people point at and say, oh my God, have we been saved? You know, لَكُنْتُ مِنَ الْمُخْضَرِينَ So in this context, you know, this, this person, the one in, in uh, paradise is looking at the guy in hellfire and he says, isn't it the case that we all got to die eventually? And didn't it happen? And except, and, and all of us, we only died once. Illa mawtatan al-ula, we only got to die once. That one death that we experience in this life. And that's it. After that, we had eternal life. We got to enjoy eternal life. Allah says at the end, inna hadha lahu al fawzul azim. No doubt, this, this, in fact, is the ultimate success. The ultimate success in this passage is to escape the temptations of a bad friend. Is to escape the constant bickering of a friend who wants to pull you into evil deeds. Right? That Allah describes it that as a normal form of success because that leads a person that might lead a person to paradise. Now you may be a qareeb, or you might have a qareeb. You might be a bad influence yourself. And you might be someone who is influenced by someone far worse than you. Right? So the reason I'm sharing this with you is to do a little bit of muhasaba. Think about your own life and what kind of what kind of role do you play among your friends? Are you the person who's always using foul language to get attention? And when those say, man, don't talk like that. Oh, well, what the boop, 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 does it matter? Right? Is that you? Are you the person that's the qareen who puts into other people's hearts that it's okay to use filthy language? Because Allah says, بِسْمُ الْفُسُوقِ بَعْدَ iman. Even the mention of terrible things is, is corruption. You know, even the mention of corrupt things is terrible after you have faith. So it's a sign of no faith that a person uses foul language. Are you the person that looks at things that are that are highly inappropriate, disgusting on the on the web, and calls others to look at them too? Are you from on those people, or are you of those who call you to those things and you get tempted by them? Are you from those people? So you know, this is this is the qari. Now there's another kind of qari. This the qari I talked to you about was the close friend, right? But there's another qaleem that's spoken about in the Qur'an and we're going to talk about that now. وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ نُقَيِّطْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَلِيمٌ Whoever walks away from the mention of the Most Merciful, whoever walks away from remembering Allah, they are too busy indulging themselves in a life of entertainment, in a life of pleasure, whatever it may be. They walk away from the remembrance of Allah, really. So they're, even when they make salah, like we just made salah less than a half hour ago, even when they made salah, it's just standing there listening to the sounds pass by their ears. They're not really remembering Allah. They're just kind of waiting, when is this over? Because i got to eat something. Right? They're not really praying. They're only standing in line because the elders say, hey, stand in line straight. And they're just standing in line straight. That's it. There's no other motivation to be in prayer except that the elders have forced you, or might as well because everybody else is doing it. Somebody might yell at me if I'm outside or something. They walked away from the remembrance of Allah. 
You see, nobody can make you remember Allah. Even if you're praying on the outside, where does remembrance of Allah take place? On the inside. Nobody can see that for you. So you can fool everybody else. You can fool your mother and your father and your, the imam or whoever, me, whoever else, the thinking you pray, you remembered Allah. But Allah knows if you remembered Him or not. You can't fool Him. You can't get past Him. So Allah says, the one who walks away from the remembrance of the exceedingly merciful, the punishment in this world is, Allah assigns and imprisons a qareen for him, a shaitan who's a qareen for him. Now what's a qareen? A friend who is always there. He's always there, right? So the moment you have a, a, you have a moment of silence, you have a moment of solitude, you're alone by yourself for not two minutes go by that an evil thought crosses your mind. What is that the case of? That's the case of someone inflicted with a qareen. A qareen has invaded their life. So they can't spend two minutes by themselves without falling into evil. You know, some of the scholars that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah describe, a person who is so sinful, the only time they're not sinning is when they're sleeping. And even then they miss salah and sin more. <laughs> right? So this is a person whose qareen is a shaitan. Really, literally a jinn, they can't even see, they think it's their own thoughts. But it's that qareen that's been assigned to them because they walked away from the remembrance of Allah. May Allah protect us from that kind of qareen. So here's that's a terrible kind of friend, a qareen. Mostly the word qareen is used in bad connotations in the Quran. The second kind of friend I want to talk to you about is khadul. Khadul. These are, I know these are hard words, you may not remember them, but at least remember the lessons behind them, inshaAllah. Khadul is a kind of friend who shows you, who wants to see you and himself have a good time. They show you that they're loyal to you. Until the time comes when you actually need them or rely on them, then they show their true colors. They weren't there for you. They had an ulterior motive. Right? You thought that they were a sincere friend. You thought that they were actually there for you. But they weren't there for you. They were for something else. Okay? So they were basically kind of using you. Okay? You were being used by someone. And I'm sure you've had experiences or you've been a <laughs> khabul to someone else. Okay? So a friend that is only there to use you. And the, one, the ultimate khadul that's mentioned in the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا that the, that, the, that the shaitan has been, has always been a khadul to the human being. Meaning this, the shaitan comes and presents him his message in a very friendly way. He doesn't come to you and say, by the way, I'm shaitan, follow me. He doesn't do that. Because anybody who would know, recognize him for shaitan would say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ and we wouldn't be interested in following shaitan, except nowadays in high schools there is a big thing with the devil worshipping cults. Right? The goth culture is getting really big into that stuff right now. Right? So even that's coming to manifest that humanity is so utterly blind that they've lost their even their animal instincts to walk away from danger, they actually want to worship shaitan. But I'm talking about the average normal people that haven't lost their humanity and fallen into goth culture, right? <laughs> Right, uh, or, or, or devil worship lyrics, you know, into music and stuff like that. But when talking about normal people, what happens to you? Shaitan comes and offers you immediate pleasure. That's the bottom line when you're young, you want things to happen for you right away. You're impatient. I was too, I'm no exception. Right? So if you're, if you're playing sports and the other team scored a couple of points and the ball hasn't been passed to you a couple of times, you get impatient on the court. Come on, man, what am I standing here? You know, that's what happens to you, you get impatient. You're, you're driving your car with friends, some guy passes you by or the red light is too long. Oh, come on, for God's sake. And you want to take revenge because you know your tribal honor has been challenged by that guy crossing you in the lane. So you need to overcome him now. We become impatient. So we, we become impatient, we can't stand in lines too long, we can't, you know, we can't wait for our parents. Your mom says, I want to talk to you about something. I want to give you some advice about preparing for your exams. Oh God. And he's, Dasha's going to give me a whole probably four minutes and 37 seconds speech. And how am I going to, you know, you're impatient. And Shaitan comes and says, look, if whatever I have to offer you, you don't have to wait. It will come right away. Two clicks away, man. Two clicks away. You just turn to that channel. Just a little phone call, just a little text. It's right away. The immediate pleasure Shaitan offers. And you would think, this is in my best interest. When you're at that age and you're hot-blooded and your temptations are, are running wild, you figure this is in your best interest, right? But you know what? Right now it seems like it's in your best interest and nobody understands you because, you know, they're all, you know, they're, 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 my parents don't understand. You ever heard that before? But your friends tell you that probably, right? M my dad's weird or my mom just, you know, she has a funny accent. She doesn't, I can't really talk to her about Twitter because she thinks there's something wrong with my eye. Right? <laughs> 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 you know? 
<laughs> so they don't, they don't, most of the parents here don't know what Twitter is, so don't try explaining it to them either. <laughs> okay. So now with that, you know, what happens is Shaitan comes and he offers you immediate incentive, immediate fulfillment of your temptations. But you know what? That is the best means for you to be destroyed. The time where you will preserve or lose your humanity is at this age. You will lose your humanity if you give in to your temptation. I'm, I'm not talking about Iman. I'm talking about your ability to be a decent human being. You will lose that. The people that fall into their temptations have no respect for themselves, nor for other human beings. And I'll be flat out with you. I, I, you know, it's high time that we talk about some of these things in, in public, in, in a, on a platform that we can be honest about. Our youth have a very serious problem, have multiple serious problems, most of which, if our elders even knew about, even a little bit, they would probably pass over. Okay, they would have heart attacks or high blood pressure problems because those even certain words that your, your children have words in their vocabulary that you don't even know exist. And if you knew they existed and what they meant, then you would probably be going to make Umrah because you heard those words and you need to compensate and sacrifice a few camels or something, right? Because you have no idea the world they, they live in. You know, and I, and I don't claim to know because I went to high school in the good old days in the 90s. And those were pretty bad, but they were the good old days compared to what is there now. But it's really bad now. And I, you know, I, I know some of this stuff, and even then my ears start getting red. And I say, man, I'm going to have teen my girls are going to be teenagers in a decade. What am I going to do? You know? So, now, having said all of that, you know, yes, the problems are different, your parents will understand, but the fact that Shaitan is calling you to them hasn't changed. He was making people, he was deceiving young people <laughs> thousands of years ago. And he's deceiving young people now. Yes, the temptations are different. The technology is different. The access is different. But the game is the same. He wants you. He wants to land you in hellfire. He wants to have you lose your decency. That's all it is. That's all the game is. So now, Shaitan will prove to be a khadul to you. Probably already in this life, you will fall into his traps, and then you'll say never again, and then fall again, and then say never again, and then fall again. But really, you'll realize he's khadul when we see him. Uh, you know on the day of judgment, when the people who followed him, may Allah not make us from them, they will be cursing him and saying, man, we should beat this guy up, he's the one who talked me into all this stuff. They'll say, you know what, let's just burn now, okay? We're all here together, can't do anything about it now. If you really had a case, you wouldn't have been here, so let's just relax, okay? Let's just enjoy the flames. So that's, you know, basically, the, in a nutshell, that's the dialogue that occurs in the Qur'an. What are you whining about now? When you had a chance to walk away, you didn't, so don't blame me, right? Don't blame the salesman. You you signed the contract and you bought the car. You can't blame the salesman. You, you should have done your own homework. So this is khadul. This is the second kind of thing. What was the first kind of thing again? I forgot. Khadim, thanks. Okay. So here's the third kind of thing. Now we talk, talk about hopefully better friends, inshaAllah. Uh, the first good friend is Rafiq. Rafiq. Rafiq comes in Arabic from the word mirtaq. Right? Mirtaq is literally a pillow, something you recline on or you relax on when you're exhausted. A Rafiq is a kind of friend you can count on. A Rafiq is a kind of friend you can turn to when you are in the hour of need. The Rafiq is the kind of friend whose advice is going to benefit you. It is going to be a source of actual comfort for you. Not deceiving comfort, but actual comfort for you. So who is your Rafiq? Allah Azza wa in the Quran, He gave us a very explicit definition of who a Rafaqa are. Who, who is going to be Rafiq for you, that kind of friend. Allah says, وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ and whoever was to obey Allah and the Messenger وسلم, then those are from those who Allah, they are they belong to the group that Allah showered his favors upon. From the Prophets, we'll talk about who these people are. For now we'll just say the relentless confirmers of truth. Washuhada and those who bear witness. والصالحين and the righteous وحسن أولئك رفيقا and how awesome these people are those are as far as being a رفيق so who are your reliable friends who are your reliable friends in other words رفيق the prophets عليهم الصلاة والسلام well they've passed away عليهم الصلاة والسلام with the exception of one who hasn't died which one hasn't died please have this okay good so we're clear on that and the second الصديقين those who relentlessly confirm the truth and they're even around today Okay, those who confirm the truth. Then as shuhada, those who bear witness, and this means those who bear witness with their speech to the truth, those who bear witness with their character to the truth. Right? These are people that live Islam and not, are not afraid to show it. They live Islam. 
And the ultimate of those are the martyrs, but it's not limited to them. And the salihin, the righteous people, people that do good things. These are the people that you can depend on. Now you have friends that are messed up. Yo, Brother Numa, I got these friends, man, they're messed up, bro. They do some really bad things, I can't even tell you, man. You, you, you won't even understand. Yes, I know, you have really messed up friends. Congratulations. If I had a cookie, I'd give you, okay? Now, the thing is, the thing to boast about isn't how messed up friends you have, but where are your good friends? You know, the measure of friendship is, is this person better than me in character or worse? Is my company around them making me a better person or a worse person? That's a good measure of whether, you're, whether or not you should be friends with these people. If they're making your language worse, your respect for elders worse, the way you spend your time is getting worse, then they're probably not good friends. They're probably not Rafiq. What are they? They're probably Qadim. Or even Khadud, right? The other kind of friend. So you need to kind of gauge the, who are the people around me that are doing better deeds than I am. That, are, that live Islam, that live, you know, they actually live a life, you know, not giving in to temptation. They live, they live for a higher purpose. And you know what? One of the things that I should share with you is those kinds of friends, you shouldn't be limiting yourself as far as the age. Some of my best friends, when I was uh, 18, 19, some of my best friends were 72, 73. Older people. Why? Because they're, they're wise, man. They're wise. They'll give you advice that no other friend your age will be able to give you. You'll talk to your friends your age about your problems, they'll say, yeah, I understand. <laughs> they don't understand squad. <laughs> they don't even understand what they're going through. How are they going to help you understand? But you speak to older people, you speak to people of wisdom, and they'll actually give you valuable advice. You can recline on them almost. You can lean on them for, for wisdom, right? So it's not, and I'm not asking you to go out and make friends with 80 year olds. But what I am asking is, don't limit yourself, well, this person's just, you know, how can this uncle be my friend? Or how can my grandmother be my friend? No, no, no. The elders have incredible wisdom to offer, and their friendship, one of the things that it does for younger people is it gives them maturity. When you hang about around people your age too much, and you don't spend any time with people that are older than you, then what happens is you become very immature. You become very, very immature. This, this, ha this ends up happening. So even for the older uh, kids here, but, you know, I, you're not really kids if you're 18, 19, but if you only hang out around 18, 19 year olds, you're going to act like 14 year olds. You're not going to act your age. But when you, you spend time with people that are older, you, that kind of rubs off on you and you become a little bit more mature. So one of the things you can do is you know, try to spend time with company that is a little bit older than you. The other thing that's a deception in our society is this idea of, oh, they're just kids. You know, that's, that's, please turn the cell phone off or talk to her. Because, you know, <laughs> she's been calling, it must be important. Anyway, so here's the thing. The, the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the notion that teenagers are just kids. Oh, they're just kids, they're just having a good time, that kind of thing, right? You know, we act according to what we believe we are. In Islam, as soon as you hit puberty, you're an adult. You're an adult. You're not treated any different, oh, come on, he's just 14. Yeah, he committed triple homicide, but he's just 14. No, 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 he's just like any other one who could, he's an adult. He'll be tried like an adult. That's the law. That's his son. In other words, when you turn a certain age, there are certain adult expectations from you. If prayer is binding upon you at an adult age, it's binding upon you when you're a certain age, when you hit puberty. That's it. You have to pray. You have to be responsible. You can't goof around. You can't do certain things that you could have done when you were a kid, right? So it doesn't matter what the society thinks of you as. The society may say, even when you're 22, oh, they're just kids, they're having fun on campus. Right, they're just, you know, they're partying, but come on, when are you gonna live it up, you know? So you kids, you have such a great time, et cetera, et cetera. But as far, if, you, if you wanna know what Allah thinks of you, what the messenger standards for you are, what this deen standardizes you as, you're an adult the moment you hit puberty, so you're responsible. So don't behind that shelter, don't hide behind that shelter on the day of judgment before Allah saying, Oh Allah, I was 19, but I was just a kid. It's not gonna fly. That's not gonna fly at all. By the way, he's really cute. So if you, if you wanna be distracted, that's a fair distraction. <laughs> okay, so we got a few kinds of friends so far. I'm gonna give you a whole list of different kinds of friends and the benefits of knowing uh, these different kinds of friends. The next kind of friend is a wadi. A wadi. Okay, the Arabic word wadi. Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ A wali is a specifically a protective friend. 
a friend who is there, not just as a friend, but they're actually there to watch your back. Okay? They've got you when you're in trouble. Okay? And they're, they're there to protect you. So, you know, you, you, would, you would have their company, especially when you know there's a danger on you. Right? Who are these people that you can rely on? Allah says your first wali is Allah. Your first protective friend is Allah. Your second protective friend is His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What that means for us today is holding on to His legacy, holding on to His sunnah is a means of protecting us. It is a means of protection. Like I tell you for a young man, to grow a beard is a big challenge, right? Because you feel like you look so pretty without it. And you stare at yourself in the mirror 45 minutes before you come out. But then if your beard is coming out all scruffy, it kind of grows here but doesn't grow here. And it's all weird looking. So you say, what am I going to follow this sunnah for? Well, once you do, you know it protects you from so many different kinds of problems. It protects you from so many fitan that would have been, you would have been afflicted with. Just by holding on to the sunnah of the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa It's a means of protection. The sunnah of the messenger says to walk with humility. The sunnah of the messenger says to lower his gaze. When he walked, he walked at this angle. So when the eyes don't meet, there's no future problems. There's no, there's none of that. You never meet, you know. The, the, the thought never crosses your mind. So there, you know, even the sunnah of the messenger is a means of protection. May Allah give us knowledge of the sunnah and commitment to the sunnah. Then he says, And of course your wali is extended not just to Allah and his messenger, but also to those who believe, all Muslims. But it's not all Muslims. Allah put a qualification here. If Allah had just said, وَالَّذِينَ amanu, that's it, those who believe. Anybody Muslim, they're your wali too. But no, no, no. Who will be the wali that you can actually turn to for counsel and protection? Who are these people? الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاءِ وَهُمْ رَكِعُونَ That they, give the, they make the salah, they establish the salah, so they're regular in their prayers. Of your Muslim friends then, who will earn the status of wali? If you have friends that don't pray regularly, well the wali thing is out for them. They can't be wali. It has to be someone who actually prays regularly. Purifies their wealth for the younger people. You don't have wealth issues yet. But when you start earning income, that they basically what this implies is they will abide by divine law. They abide by the sacred law. And then Allah says, وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ And they remain in a state of rukuwa. Even though He already mentioned salah already, what this implies is that they are humble people. That they are in a state of rukuwa. Rukuwa implies also humility. So your, your, the awliya will be people that are humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of times, and this is something I've noticed uh, back in the times in the 1800s when I was in high school, it may or may not be still true, so let me, let me run it by you, see if it's true or not. In, in the time when I was in high school, one of the most glorified things, one of the things that was most um, looked up to was how, how well you can boost your own ego. How, you know, the kind of walk you have, and the kind of clothes you wear, and the kind of obscene language you use, and how loud you can be, and how obnoxious you can be, and how well you can insult someone else, all of this would go together to figure it to, in the calculation of how popular you are, and how much you should be looked up to. One of the things, how arrogant you are, how obnoxious you are, how insulting and disrespectful you are to teachers and elders, how uh, obscenely you speak, how, how much disregard you have for, for appropriateness, Right? These were the things that will make you popular. These are the things that, oh man, this guy is so messed up. I want to be just like him. Can I hang out with that? <laughs> you know. So basically, the more you act like shaitan, right, the more of a role model you are. And on the other hand, you have Allah's standards, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing He asks of His believers is humility. On the one hand, you have arrogance being glorified. And on the other hand, you have what being glorified? Humility, right? And our, uh, so the, the, the teenager <coughs> sees this for a week, for five days in school, they see arrogance being glorified. And then they cut school and they come to Jum'ah khutbah and they hear humility being glorified. How many times? Once. By some guy who they probably fell halfway asleep anyway in the khutbah. And they came out and you asked them what was the khutbah about and they say something about Islam or something. <laughs> right? No, really. <laughs> You know, so what do you think they're going to start? What's going to start affecting you? A, a lifestyle of humility or a lifestyle of arrogance? Because yeah. you're spending so much time in an, in an, in an environment that, that glorifies arrogance, it's going to start becoming a part of you. And how do you know it's becoming a part of you? Your parents say, did you do your homework? Come on, mom! 
We've been through this. There's a call for you. All right. Come down for dinner. Oh, God. This, if, if that's if that's your normal reaction, then you have a serious problem. You have a problem bigger than the guy who sells liquor from the liquor store. You know he sells haram, right? That's haram. But you know a bigger crime in the eyes of Allah is arrogance. Arrogance that lies in the heart. The Messenger told us, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whoever even has the amount of little, like a seed's worth of arrogance in their heart, will never see paradise. They will never see paradise. So you think those people are doing wrong? You're doing far, far worse if you have a seed of arrogance in your heart. And while I'm on the topic, I see some of the youth here that seem like they're more committed to the religion than others. Let me give you a little bit of advice, inshallah, that applies to myself too. When you see other youth that are not as religious, and in the back of your mind, you think somehow you are better than they are, or somehow Allah is more pleased with you than He is with them, then realize that that is a form of arrogance. And you, nobody will see it. You're making salah, you're attending the halaqat, and you're dressed, and your appearance is that of a righteous person. Anybody will see you, and this other thug on the street, they say, this guy is good. That guy pretty bad, right? But Allah knows that there is a seed of arrogance inside. So watch out for it. Nobody can point that out to you, unless you do introspection of yourself. So this is what, moving along quickly inshaAllah, just a few more kinds of friends. Sadiq. Sadiq is actually the most sincere, the most truthful, the friend who will tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. You know, they will tell, they will know what's best, what, what is in your best interest and they won't shy away in saying it. You know how sometimes your friends will tell you the right thing because they think your feelings might get hurt or you might, they, you might take it the wrong way or something. A Sadiq wouldn't do that. A Sadiq would tell you like it is. Look. I love you for the sake of Allah, that's messed up. You gotta stop. You can't do that anymore. This is a Sadiq. We pray we have a Sadiq in our life. Right? A, a sincere friend who can look at our flaws and say, you know what? That needs to change. If you don't change that, you're gonna have some serious problems. The way you talk to your mother, you probably shouldn't do that. Like you're talking to your friend and your dad calls and you, you kind of roll your eyes at your dad. Or you say, yeah, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm on the phone, whatever. Right? And your friend who's a Sadiq says, no, you know what? I'll talk to you later. You need to go listen to your dad. That's far more important. Right? That would be a Sadiq. So we pray that Allah grants us that kind of Sadiq. And you know, uh, uh, the sincerity of Yusuf alayhi salam, he was thrown in prison. You know that, right? He was thrown in prison. So obviously all around him are what kind of people? Convicts. Right? They're, they're all cons. They're all criminals from all kinds of crimes. Right? So they're the worst kind of people in society that he stuck with for many, many years. And you know, with that kind of environment even, his character would show, so that when they came to him even, they would say a Siddiq. They would say a sincere one, the one who who's never shies away from telling the truth. Which tells us even in the prison, when somebody did something wrong, he would say, that's not right. And regardless of the consequences, he would stand up for, for the truth, alayhi salam. So that is a Siddiq. The last couple left, inshaAllah, there's a Khalid. Khalid. Khalid is a very close friend, a one for whom you feel in your heart. When you, it's like a brother or a sister, a sibling almost, right? That deeply connected love you feel for them. Any pain that comes to them hurts you. Any joy that comes to, you, to them gives you joy. This is a khalid. And this is a relationship that is so honored in the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَاتَّخَلَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Allah took Ibrahim alayhi salam as a khalid, as an intimate, as a close, close friend. This, is, this illustrates the closeness Ibrahim alayhi salam had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is really important because Ibrahim alayhi salam, many, many, many times he was all by himself. All by himself. So who's the only friend he had? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's being thrown into the fire, nobody on his side. Allah is on his side. He's in the middle of the desert, nobody on his side. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on his side. Right? So he took, he found that, 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 that khulla with Allah azza wa ta'ala. Allah says, on the day of judgment, la bay'un fihi wa la khullata. He says on the day of judgment, there's not going to be any exchanges, any trade, nor is there going to be any intimate friendship. The closest friend you had before you came on the day of judgment, the closest friend you had will be walking away from you, like I don't want anything to do with this guy. That's what's going to end up happening on the day of resurrection. So realize the kinds of friends we make and where we have our khullam, where we have the closest friendship. Last bit inshallah, a, a, a term related to khullam is the, the, the friend Hameen. The friend Hameen. Hameen is someone who may or may not be close to you, but at least acts like they are. 
They act very close to you. They, they express their closeness to you in their action. They're very kind to you. They're very generous to you. They're always there when you want them to be. So this is where Khalil is on, in the heart. Harim is manifest. It's on the outside. You can see their friendship manifest. <coughs> Allah describes the Day of Judgment, وَلَا يَسْأَلُوا حَمِيمٌ حَمِيمًا These friends that used to go all out for each other, they were always there for each other, they are not going to be even asking about one another. They're not even going to ask. Forget concern, they're not even going to ask about one another. وَلَا يَسْأَلُوا حَمِيمٌ حَمِيمًا Even if they're staring at each other or they're being stared at, even then, they won't even ask about each other. So understand the reality of, of resurrection. When a Muslim believes in resurrection, they believe in something very powerful. The one of the most powerful elements of resurrection that I want to remind you of that has to do with this talk, Allah says, وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ Relationships on that day will be chopped off. Relationships will mean nothing on the day of judgment. All the relationships you have now, a lot of times you do wrong things because your friends are doing them. Like I know graduation's coming up soon, so the prom's coming up soon, right? All my friends are going. So now you're crying your heart out, and your parents are saying, no, this is haram. Oh, come on, everything's haram. Can't do anything. You know, this is haram, that's haram, you know. You guys just say everything's haram. You don't let me have any fun. Or if it's so haram, how come my other Muslim friends are going? <laughs> right, because that happens too. Right? So, so when that happens, you, right now you think you're going and your reputation is going to be ruined. Nobody cares when you go to college, by the way. Who showed up at the prom with me? So please, it's not the end of the world. There are far bigger problems. There are people that haven't had food to eat for a week, and you're crying over the prom. Or you're crying over some party you can't go to. Get over yourself. Really. You know, Allah has blessed this ummah, and the Muslims especially. Really. You know, Allah has blessed this ummah, and the Muslims especially, you know, in, in this part of the world with so much wealth, and so much luxury, that we have forgotten what it is to have favors from Allah. And here we have our youth whining about things that if the people, the people in some parts of the Muslim world, they only dream about those things and we're complaining about them. Oh man, only one kind of soda in the fridge? You know, there are kids in the Muslim world that haven't had water for two weeks. You know, they, they're drinking out of mud, literally. And here we, we are, we become so ungrateful. And this is again, when you become distant, the one who doesn't remember the merciful, the one who doesn't remember Allah, doesn't remember their place in the world. They become full of themselves, and that's where you get all of these problems. When you don't remember who you are, you're a servant of Allah, and Allah is our provider, and He is the provider of all. May Allah eliminate hunger from the world. Anyhow, so uh, coming to a close because Salah is approaching also, another kind of friend that is mentioned in the Quran is a walij. Walijah, literally, actually. Okay? وَلَمْ يَتَّخِذْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلَا رَسُولِهِ وَلَا مُؤْمِنِينَ وَلِيجَةً This actually is a kind of friend who you trust so much, that they're actually involved in your private matters. They help you out maybe in a business transaction, or loaning you money, or things like that, or you got into a dispute and they're helping you manage that dispute or something like that, right? This is the kind of friend that's wali. This is only supposed to be a Muslim. You can be casually friends with a non-Muslim, that's fine. You could say, hi, how's it going, whatever. Can I borrow a pencil or something at school? But the people that are involved in your personal life, shouldn't be anything other than believers, true believers. And not even al-ladina amanu al mu'minin, which implies the strongest of believers. These are the people you should trust your affairs with. Lastly, Ya ayyuha al-ladina amanu la tattakhidu bitanatan min dunikum la ya'lunakum khabar. Last kind of friend. Those of you who believe, hear this warning carefully. Allah says, don't take secret keeping friends outside of yourselves. What does it mean outside of yourselves? What do you think? What do you think it means outside of yourselves? Those of you that are still awake. <laughs> outside of Muslims. Don't have friends that keep your secrets outside of any Muslims. La يَأْلُونَكُمْ لَا يَأْلُونَكُمْ وَدُّ مَا عَنِكُمْ They will leave no stone unturned in causing you harm. And they really do want what will harm you. Non-Muslims will give you what kind of advice? Non-Muslim kind of advice. Non-Muslim kind of advice will benefit you or harm you? It will only harm you. You think it will benefit you? It will only harm you. What do ma amittum? You know, they want what will harm you. They don't even know what will harm them. They're so ignorant. That's why they're not Muslim. <laughs> if they knew what was good for them, they would be on Islam. Rubama ya wadu lathina kafaru lau kanu muslimin. You know, a time will come when disbelievers are going to wish that they had been Muslims. Had they only known. Lau ka, you know, 
Had we only known, لو كنا نسمع ونعقل, if we only heard and understood, these are the kinds of complaints that disbelievers will make. So these were a few things about different kinds of friends that are mentioned in our sacred literature. The bottom line though, the thing that runs through this entire talk, the thread that connects it all, was the first hadith that I mentioned to you. المرؤ على دين خليله فلينظر أحدكم من يقال A person depends on the religion of who? The friend. Watch out who you make friends with. The parents here, watch out who your kids are friends with. Make sure that you make them friends with people that are better role models for them rather than opening doors to sins for them. If you want your parents, to, your kids to not have problems anymore, no, you can't take them to any imam who will recite something over them and, and their problems will disappear. That's not going to happen, right? There's not a speech they're going to listen to that will change their character. It might affect them a little bit. What will really affect them in the long run? Their friends. Their friends. And the young people here take this advice seriously. You know, I can't, I can't make you do anything. I can't make you change your friends. I can't cha make you change your profile on Facebook and the 500 people that are already, you know, connected with you or whatever. These friends, these strangers that you call friends, they're not your friends. They're not going to care about you, right? The, the people who care about you, I, I hopefully I tried an outline, inshallah ta'ala. The last thing I'll, I'll, I'll share, I know I, I said these are all the kinds of friends, but there's one that I didn't mention on purpose, because I was kind of, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but maybe I should mention it. Allah Azza wa also speaks of akhdan, friends that you are attracted to. Nowadays we call it boyfriend or girlfriend. Allah speaks about that in the Quran too. Allah says when you're looking to get married, it's not just that you're looking to find akhdan. It's not just some you know shallow infatuation. Marriage is far more to us than it will ever be to the non-Muslim. Marriage to the Muslim is far, far more. It is not something shallow like, oh, she's cute, I want to marry her. No, it's far more responsible. So don't be given, don't give in to these lowly standards, these at lower than animal standards that have been set for you by pathetic media that you are hypnotized by, by watching it every single day, like you know a bunch of animals that haven't been given, given their food to eat at the farm that they start whining, you start whining when the next episode is going to air because you're so addicted, right? If that's how pathetic you become, then you're losing your humanity, seriously. Lose your addictions. Lose your addiction to entertainment. Lose your addiction to the, you know these kinds of lowly things. And uh, if you have, if you've gotten, if you become part of a relationship, and this is a reality of the Muslim youth, if there's some girl you've been texting or talking to or getting together with or some boy, if that's happening, nobody knows. I am not saying I know, but if that's happening, walk away. Walk away from it. Save yourself now. No, you you think nobody's watching? Allah is watching. Allah knows. You think you're out of trouble because your parents don't know? Allah knows and that's far more trouble. Believe me, that is far If you have an ounce of belief left, then walk away from those situations. Just just walk, don't, you don't have to say, by the way, I heard this speech, I'm walking away. No, just walk away. Leave it. Inshallah ta'ala. May Allah protect our, our youth from all kinds of trials that surround us.